Uh, good afternoon, everyone, An Introduction to Ethics. Uh, the purpose of today's lecture is to discuss the second reading that's assigned to you for this week. Um, we jump ahead quite a bit in the Republic. Uh, we jump ahead to, with today's reading starting on page 105 at 427D, and I really do want to make sure that you uh, start there specifically because um, there's a lot in between that we obviously didn't read. And I'm having you begin at a specific point so that we can look at the specific virtues that um, that are going to be associated with the city. And so on that point about the city, let's just uh, review a little bit. <clears throat> uh, recall that what's going on uh, in the last reading is that Glaucon has made a case against living a just life, even though Glaucon himself does not necessarily agree with the argument he's making, he wants Socrates to provide an account of why living a just life is worth something. In other words, he's asking him to provide a definition of justice, and uh, he thinks that the case Socrates makes will be that much stronger because he has made such a good case against it. And so the way that the reading ended last time was that Socrates says that he doesn't think he can give an account of what justice looks like in an individual, but that he can give an account of what justice looks like in a city. And Socrates, and this is the, the premise of Plato's argument that you really have to accept and buy into in order to be convinced by this, what's going to be called a city-soul analogy, which is to say that uh, the virtues that we find in the city can also be found in the soul. And so there's a crucial passage that I want to point out, and I'm reading here from the lecture notes for today. Socrates um, had said on pages 45 and 46, towards the end of the reading um, before, Socrates writes, um, Socrates writes, Well then, I said, a city comes into being because each of us isn't sufficient, isn't self-sufficient, but is in need of much. Do you believe there's another beginning to the founding of a city? And so there Socrates was saying that a city arises naturally because each of us on our own realize that we cannot uh, get by without help from somebody else. Um, I on my own can gather food and grow food, uh, but maybe I need someone to potentially, you know, kill the animals for me because I can't do that on my own. And I need somebody to help me construct a shelter for myself, something like that. So, so the point was Socrates was making there is that um, the point Socrates was making there is simply that the city arises out of the realization that no one can live on their own entirely, that each of us on our own uh, cannot be entirely self-sufficient. And, that's, and so therefore, this is how a city arises. Now, we're jumping ahead to this point, to where Socrates has actually finished setting up the city. And there are a lot of details that go along with it. For the, for the purposes of this class, for the purposes of an ethics class, I'm not going to go into the specific details and arrangement that Socrates sets up. Uh, we're picking up in the reading where Socrates has... Uh, finished setting up the city, and he's now going to discuss each of the virtues that is going to be associated with each part of the city that he has described in the portion of the reading that we didn't read. But it might be helpful to just uh, think about what would be required of any group of individuals who wanted to begin and set up their own society. And when I teach this usually in person, the, what I do is I ask students, imagine that a group of you wanted to go off on your own into the woods and begin your own society. Uh, you wanted to start it from scratch. 
what would that look like? What would you need to do? And usually it doesn't take long, I think, at least, for students to realize that, um, well, maybe they're going to need somebody who uh, can be a leader, somebody who can be in charge and to help uh, defend uh, or, well, not, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit, somebody who can uh, make the rules and enforce the rules and be in charge of the rules. Um, and so you need a leader who can organize the group. That seems to be something that, that isn't really all that controversial. Um, the other thing you're going to potentially need is a way to defend yourself. Uh, you're going to need, uh, which in sort of, you know, on a bigger scale, what we call a military, you're going to at least need a group of individuals who's willing to defend your society from the uh, encroachment from other um, potentially societies that, that are out there as well. And so you're going to need a leader, and you're going to need some individuals willing to defend your city. Um, and then you're also going to need individuals who are willing to make things. Um, individuals who uh, are willing to go out and, and, I don't know, do the hunting and do the gathering and, um, and build shelters. And uh, as the city becomes more advanced, they're going to be able to make... Uh, you know, um, goods, more uh, specific um, itemized goods that you might need so that they can make them and maybe eventually they can sell them. We're, we're obviously going to be a, at a, an advanced stage by that point, but if you think about individuals in our own society, we have a whole class of workers and laborers who are willing to do the work necessary uh, to make goods and sell goods for the economy. So you're going to need a whole group of people willing to do that. So you need a leader, you need people willing to defend the city, and you need workers. That seems pretty, we can grant that that all seems like um, you don't need to necessarily, um, you know, disagree with Plato about this because any city or any society would potentially need these things. And so each of these groups is going to be given a name. And this is what, this is kind of where we're getting to in today's reading. Um, we're going to have the guardians, who are going to be called the rulers. We're going to have a warrior class that guards the city. And then we're going to have, um, we're going to have workers. Um, and I don't specifically remember what Plato refers to them as in today's reading, but we're going to need a group of individuals that are going to be basically a group of laborers who are willing to work and make things for the city. Um, and that is basically, if you can buy all of that, um, then you can see that this would be what is required at a minimum, right? At a minimum. Because, of course, you might say as the city becomes more advanced, we need more and more and more things. We need more and more functions. But at a minimum, it seems like we can grant Plato that these three groups are going to be needed for the city to function. Somebody in charge, somebody to defend, and somebody to work. Seems pretty... I think we can grant Plato those arguments. Now, Plato's argument then is that associated with each of these groups um, is going to be a virtue. Now, let me say a, a little bit about what a virtue is. Uh, for Plato and then later for Aristotle, a virtue is a way of being. Um, and it's a way in which you find yourself and that... If you find yourself in this state of being and in this condition, it means you are excelling at the kind of creature that you are. Now that sounds abstract, so let's just... For the Greeks, you could say that anything has a virtue. Um, uh, what do I have around me? We could say that, that a pen, this pen that I have here, is virtuous. It sounds strange, but... If the pen is writing well, if it is uh, it has just the right, um, you know, you don't have to press down too hard when you're writing. It has a nice flow of ink. I know this sounds ridiculous, but we would say that the pen is virtuous in some way. It is, it is behaving and acting like a pen should act. And so it would be a virtuous pen. Similarly we can say 
that associated with any specific kind of individual, there will be a virtue associated with them, which is to say a specific character trait or skill that when they are so when they are doing that thing well, we can recognize them as a virtuous individual. And so Plato is going to go one by one through these uh, groups and show the virtue that is associated with them. That in order to be called, for example, a good ruler, they must have a specific thing that they're doing. And if they aren't doing that thing, we don't recognize them as a ruler. So there are going to be four virtues that Plato is going to discuss. And that comes up right at the beginning of the reading on page 105. He says that in a city that's perfectly good, we're going to be able to locate four virtues. A why, the city will be wise, the city will be courageous, the city it will be moderate, and the city will be just. And of course, the search for the whole thing is we're trying to locate the definition of justice, but he needs to go through these other three things first, right? So let's start at the top. Let's start with the rulers. Um, Plato and or Socrates and Glaucon agree that the that the virtue that we're going to associate with the leader is a kind of knowledge, a kind of wisdom. But not just a specific kind of wisdom or knowledge, right? Because of course on page 10, of course on page uh, on page 106, when the, when they're engaging in this conversation, um, you know, Glaucon sort of um, or Socrates kind of humorously asks, quote, then it is thanks to the carpenter's knowledge that the city must be called wise and of good counsel. And of course, the response from from Glaucon is no. It's not that it's not a specific kind of knowledge that we're looking for. It's not a knowledge of the specific parts. It's a knowledge of the whole. It's a knowledge of how the city should be organized as a whole. That um, that that that's that we're going to associate with the ruler or the guardian. That the guardian doesn't need to concern himself with the specific day-to-day -day operations of each individual task, like the carpenter, right? But in fact, the, 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 the wisdom that we're looking for here has to be a knowledge and a wisdom of how everything works together. It has to be a knowledge of the whole, not a knowledge of the parts. And once we figure out what... Um, once we figure out um, what that kind of knowledge is and who should be in charge, the virtue that they have with them is this kind of wisdom. And if they are truly going to be a virtuous ruler, then they must be wise. So that's, you know, I think fairly straightforward. The next group that Plato considers are uh, the warriors, those who are going to defend and guard the city. And it seems like the most straightforward uh, way to think about this is, is that, of course, we want the warriors to be courageous. We want these individuals to exhibit the virtue of courage. Now, the way that um, courage ends up getting defined by Plato here is an interesting one. It's not, you know, um, courage is actually going to be associated with a kind of knowledge. Um, and the, the, the way that, that courage gets defined on the bottom of page 107 is the preserving of the opinion produced by law through education about what and what sort of thing is terrible. Now, all that um, Plato is, is getting at here is that the guardians are going to be charged with enforcing the law. And uh, in order to enforce the law, they need to have a knowledge of what it is that the city should and shouldn't actually be afraid of, right? The city probably should potentially be afraid of an invading army, for example. But maybe the city doesn't need to be afraid of other things. And so uh, this, the, 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 the warriors, in order to defend the city, they need to know the things that actually threaten the city and the things that don't threaten the city. 
And with that knowledge, they're going to keep the city safe. If they're wasting their time defending the city from all kinds of things that aren't really uh, that, uh, that, that, that actually pose that much of a threat, well then, uh, they're not going to be excelling in being warriors. So the virtue here is courage, and courage involves the knowledge of what, what to be afraid of and what not to be afraid of. So that's the virtue associated with that. Um, now, the, the, um, there's not a specific virtue associated with the craftsman or the working class. The craftsmen do not have a specific virtue associated with them. All they need to do is they need, a, they need to know how to make things. So a carpenter knows how to make furniture. They should make furniture and make it really, really well. And they should have the knowledge of how to do that. And that's what they should be engaged in. But they shouldn't necessarily be concerned with defending the city, and they shouldn't be concerned with ruling the city. The craftsmen and the workers should allow the warriors and the guardians to do their work, to do their job, to uh, rule over the city and to defend the city um, with their wisdom and with their courage. And so even though there's not a specific virtue associated with them, um, Plato's going to make the argument that um, there is going to be a way to think about um, what the craftsmen should be willing to do for the city to function properly. And so on page 109, he's going to start talking about this third virtue that he's going to call moderation. And um, he refers in particular here, we, when he thinks about uh, the way that people talk and the way that he says, he's referring to this phrase, stronger than himself. Right? And we often we think about this that there that there is a part of ourselves that we that we think is is stronger and a part that is that is weaker and we need to be able to control that part of ourselves right and so um, if you look at page 109 I'm, I'm going to read here for a moment but I said this speech looks to me as if it wants to say that so they're going to be talking about the soul here and that's going to come up in the next reading. In the same human being, there is something better and something worse. The phrase stronger than himself is used when that which is better by nature is master over that which is worse. And then he goes on to say, Now then, I said, take a, take a glance at our young city and you'll find one of these conditions. For you'll say that it's justly designated stronger than itself. If that in which the better rules over the worse must be called moderate and stronger than itself. So all he's referring to here is that within a city, we would recognize, within the city that Plato is setting up, we're going to recognize that there is the rulers who should rule and the craftsmen who should produce. And what the craftsmen need to be willing to do is to agree that the rulers should rule and the uh, they should produce that they should not try to rule because what they're good at is making things they're good at making money they're good at selling their things but they don't have the knowledge of how to rule and so moderation is when there is a kind of harmony between the parts when each part is is functioning and kind of doing the thing that it's supposed to do whenever that harmony is present whenever the craftsmen are making things Whenever the guardian, whenever the warriors are defending the city, and whenever the rulers are um, ruling over the city, then that will be harmony. When there is a balance and harmony, or that will be moderation. Excuse me. Whenever there is a balance and harmony of each part. Now, the big picture here is that we're looking for justice. So we've got the three virtues so far. We've got wisdom, which is the virtue associated with the rulers, the knowledge of how to rule the city. As a whole and not simply as a part, we've got the uh, warriors who are courageous, who uh, know uh, what the city should and shouldn't be afraid of so that they can effectively defend it. And now we've got this third virtue, moderation, which is um, more or less an agreement between the craftsmen to remain making and producing things and not try to become rulers. 
because there is a part that by nature is weaker. In this case, Plato is saying that the craftsmen are, in a sense, weaker and that the rulers are stronger. And then there's going to be one more um, There's going to be one more virtue that we're looking for here, and of course that is justice. And at the bottom of at the bottom of one eleven, what what Plato realizes and what Socrates realizes that in fact um, there is actually justice has been in front of them the whole time, right? That in fact all along justice was there; they just didn't see it. It was right under their noses, right? And and the way that this is, what justice is going to be, justice is going to be end up being defined here. Justice is very close to moderation here. On page uh, 111, towards the bottom at B, we have Socrates saying, and further, that justice is the minding of one's own business and not being a busybody. This we have both heard from many others and have often said ourselves. And then a little bit further down. After having considered moderation, courage, and prudence, this is what's left over in the city. It provided the power by which all these other came into being. And once having come into being, it provides them with present preservation as long as it's in the city. Right? And so justice ends up is the thing that makes all of the other virtues possible. Justice is the minding of one's own business. So so moderation, as I described, is a kind of agreement between the, the craftsmen and the rulers, that the craftsmen will make things and the rulers will rule. Justice seems as though it's a kind of carrying out that agreement, that each in part will do the thing that it does and do it well. And if, if, the, if, the, if each part does the thing that it does and it does it well and it doesn't interfere with the other parts, we can call that city just, which is to say... The city has a kind of structural integrity then, that without justice, the city would fall apart. We, it's fine to be able to say the rulers should rule and the, and, the, and the warriors should be courageous and the craftsmen should make things. It's fine to say that in the abstract, but actually being able to carry that out in practice, to have each part doing that thing and doing it virtuously and doing it well, that is justice. It's when I mind my own business and I don't interfere with um, the, the workings of another part of the city. And as long as I'm willing to do that, then um, the city can be just. And you, so you can see why justice is so crucial here. It keeps everything running smoothly. It makes all of the other virtues possible. It's the big picture. And so that is going to end up being the kind... So this is the first attempt at a definition of justice. And recall what Glaucon and Adiamantus wanted from Socrates to begin with, which was that they wanted Socrates to defend justice. They wanted him to show why justice is worth something. And now we have a first glimpse at what that is. Justice is worth something because it makes the entire functioning of the city possible. It gives the city integrity. It allows the city to know itself as having the knowledge that each part is doing the thing that it's supposed to do and does it well. The city will run well and run smoothly and run efficiently if each part is doing that. If it doesn't, it won't even be a city, right? So that's why justice is worth something, is that it keeps everything together, it keeps everything whole. Now, the next lecture we're going to pick up with... We've now... Remember, the argument is the city-soul analogy. So he's shown what justice is in the city. Now he thinks justice must show up the same way in the individual soul of the person. And we're going to see that in the next reading.